great. Thank you. Uh, this is an absolute honor to be here. I've been a, a TED fan for, for years, and uh, it's, a, it's a real gift to be with you today. Um, I think I, I w decided to start today really with uh, the opening slide for my favorite TED Talk, John Doerr, in uh, 2007. And he, he began with uh, this notion of uh, there is a time when panic is the appropriate response. <laughs> this is Eugene Kleiner. He's a, uh, one of the most successful venture capitalists uh, out of Silicon Valley. And uh, today I'm here to, to talk with you about uh, an organization I have a real privilege working with called the Dispensary of Hope, a non-for-profit supply chain company. Uh, I think the least sexy description uh, of any sort of non-profit organization. But well, when I talk about panic, I mean panic. I mean uh, 47 million uninsured people. You know, recent figures talk about it being closer to, to 50 million. Uh, if we keep going, we talk about six million children. Uh, that is one in uh, nine. And, and the numbers become sort of staggering. You know, 47 million, that's, that's the entire country of South Africa. And what would we think about a country that, that leaves that many people sort of uncovered? Uh, just in Tennessee, we have over 1.7 million Tennesseans that go uncovered every day. And I, uh, I will attest, you know, I'm sort of a, a reformed venture capitalist, right? I didn't have a real uh, appreciation for the number of people who are uninsured until you get out there and you start meeting them. You hear these tremendous stories of what people are going through, literally spending hours in a day trying to track down their prescriptions. Time that people are, are spending, you know, away from work, uh, simply trying to make sure that they can uh, sort of maintain their job and maintain their, their lives. Um, when, when we keep going, we find that 27% of these folks have been uninsured for less than six months. Uh, but a really amazing number, 73% have been uninsured for more than six months. This is, this is a chronic condition for people. Uh, and, you know, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I'm used to sort of going to the doctor, finding out what's wrong with me, and then driving to Walgreens to get my prescription filled, or CVS, whatever your retail pharmacy of choice, right? It's, it's debilitating, really, to find out that you can be diagnosed with something and then have no position to do anything about it. And so when we gather together, uh, we find that 74% are employed uh, part-time or full-time, uh, again, trying to make this work for them. So the question should be, is it worth trying to do, not can it be done, right? Are we, we should be getting up in the morning thinking about these social problems, and, and we may not have an answer, but we need to remain committed to solving them. And I think uh, when we started on this journey, we had no idea what we were doing and uh, had no idea how we were going to, to get done what we needed to. Our inspiration comes from a, a great allergist in town, Dr. Bruce Wolf, uh, who had done a meticulous study around his own sample usage in his practice. And he found that uh, over 30% of his samples uh, simply went unused. And that, this is a physician who was deeply committed to his patients and was using them to help subsidize patients who couldn't afford them. Um, at 30%. Now, uh, just by a frame of reference here, uh, there are $20 billion samples, uh, $20 billion worth of samples in the United States, that, which would equate to about $6 billion worth of medication simply being destroyed, and unfortunately often being destroyed inappropriately. And so as we got into things, we started to learn a little bit more. Uh, we started devising a plan, but we didn't want to uh, replace something. We didn't want to do something that would uh, sort of take the place of existing resources. Uh, and so we ended up settling on a red bin. Right? Uh, it, it doesn't get much more simple or much less exciting than a simple red bin. Uh, and more importantly, we started to take a look. We, we went down and saw the float folks at Netflix. Uh, we visited the folks at UPS. We wanted to get an understanding of sort of how, how might we move medicine? How might we move medicine? And in the end, we found ourselves with about a thousand pages of red tape, right? If, if you want to, you know, sort of pick on the most regulated industry for good reasons, uh, welcome to the pharmaceutical industry, right? Uh, and all the things that go into ensuring sort of what they call pedigree, ensuring that uh, we know where every pill of medicine is, every way uh, and shape in the supply chain. Uh, so we settled on this red bin, and what happens now 
is a physician can call a 1-800 number and they get a red bin, much like the one up on the screen, shipped to their office. And they take sample medications nearing expiration. We take anything uh, with at least three months left on it. We can move it uh, to a patient uh, within three months. And they send it into our warehouse, uh, which looks something sort of like this. Uh, if you look up in the top, uh, you've got sort of where our medication comes from. Uh, right now we have over 1,300 physicians who participate in our program and they take, get this little red bin, fits nicely in their uh, little closet area. It was sort of designed to fit in that space. Uh, and they zip tie it, they sign a pay bill, it comes right into our uh, warehouse right here in Nashville. We also get overproduction. So as much as pharmaceutical companies work to be incredibly efficient, they do overproduce. Uh, we found that uh, one of our biggest innovations was to have a warehouse with two bay doors in it where people can simply, uh, if you're a manufacturer, put their overproduction and it comes in on a pallet. Uh, and last but not least, there are distributors who end up with uh, medications that run over. Those two sort of come in. What was different about us, we had a lot of people suggest that we get in the actual dispensing business, that they suggested that we start um, opening up essentially retail locations. Uh, and they did that because you, know, you really want to control uh, where those medications are going, how they're dispensed. But in, in reality, uh, we were making a, another uh, challenge for these patients, right? The idea of having to, to go to somewhere else other than where you're being seen by a physician seemed like another travesty. For those of you who've never tried to actually go across town on the public transit system, you know, it's a significant challenge. It's a half day investment. So what we did is we teamed up and we talked to the boards of pharmacy uh, and uh, wholesale distributors in different states and we decided to partner up with anybody who's technically licensed to dispense medication. And so if you're a clinic, uh, meaning a, a, a free clinic or a federal qualified health center, um, you can actually dispense our medication. If you're a retail pharmacy that's not for profit, you can dispense our medication. If you want to build a community pharmacy for the uninsured, you can uh, dispense our medication. So as you look at this diagram, you get a sense of how this works. Uh, money gets uh, uh, information and medications get aggregated from our various sources. They come in, uh, we put, break them down, put them in inventory, and then dispensing sites from all over the country uh, get online and order it. This is what's significant. Uh, you know, we went out uh, into the world and found that nobody was doing what we were doing. Uh, which can be a good thing, but uh, it can also be a daunting thing. So we find ourselves needing to build our own IT infrastructure uh, to, where, to where we're at right now. We track every pill to every patient. Right? Every pill to every patient. Right? We've become sort of the Met McKesson of medicine for the uninsured. And in that process, we've begun uh, aggregating lots of data. For the first time, we know where this uninsured population lives. We understand what medications are requesting, what they need. And so passively, we're beginning to understand this population more and more. We're understanding what they need from us and how we can better respond to them in an efficient manner. Uh, and so when we got into this, we realized that we needed to be sustainable, right? We're talking about medicine here. It doesn't lend itself to a scenario in which it's there one day and not the other. Uh, and uh, that poses two challenges, a medication challenge, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also uh, talks about an economic challenge. Uh, and then we came across some research that found that hospitals have a very vested interest in making this work. They have a very vested interest in making this work. This work being uh, caring for this uninsured population. Uh, so for us, uh, a site can uh, spend $7,500 a year, and they can order up to $250,000 worth of medication. Right. What the research shows is that for every dollar of medication provided, uh, $3.65 in bad debt is saved. So you can spend $7,500 with our program and save $912,000 in bad debt. Right. Those are big numbers. And so we said, well, here's the solution. Let's go talk to hospitals and get them to sponsor clinics in their area to order medicine from us. Ended up not being that complicated. <laughs> what we found was that we also had great supporters in the pharmaceutical industry. 
And uh, we also found that there were huge costs elsewhere in the industry. So what I just talked about was what we call our instant access program, the ability to deliver medications to people right there when they're being diagnosed. But the problem is some medications aren't sampled, some medications uh, will have a large volume to them, others will be small, and it gets harder to meet some of those uh, unique needs and people inevitably fall through the cracks. So we uh, sort of got uh, with some various manufacturers and said, tell me how you do national prescription assistance, right? We, we're all in this healthcare reform uh, debate. You know, pharmacy saying we'll help supply medications. Uh, and it turns out that it's all run by uh, third parties out there. They pay third parties to administer these programs, qualify them, enroll them. And we sort of said, you know, that, that's got to cost you a good little bit of money. Would you be interested in outsourcing that to us? How about, how about we share the burden with the patient uh, who's very motivated and um, in exchange for lowering your costs, you support more medicine. I'm happy to say these three folks signed up. AstraZeneca, Merck, and Novartis uh, came to the uh, challenge and uh, we'll have a fourth being announced uh, next week. What that means is that we've got 47 medications. Doesn't sound like a lot, but they are big time demand medications that uh, we're gonna be piloting for Tennessee. Uh, so every Tennessean that qualifies uh, will have these medicines as long as they need them. For as long as they need them. And they qualify for the program. Yeah. But then, then we got into the process not knowing what we were getting into. Uh, and we realized that there are a lot more medicines out there that people need rather than these 47. And so we designed our enrollment form uh, to essentially uh, allow them to enroll in every other national prescription assistance program, right? So now uh, you just have to fill out one form. If, uh, if we have the medicine, we dispense it to you within 48 hours. And if not, we immediately sign you up using the information you provided for every other national prescription assistance program, right? All for $30 for that person, all for $30. The interesting thing here uh, is what we've been able to accomplish. Right now, we're running over 125,000 prescriptions annually for the poor and uninsured in our communities. Uh, we have uh, uh, sourced over $20 million worth of medication. And uh, most notably, in the, in the state of Tennessee, where we started, we have 22 sites. Uh, what we find is that we're now serving more than 50 counties and providing access to more than 80,000 patients. Right. What's even more exciting is we're starting to see sort of this groundswell of support. Uh, right now we have 57 sites in 12 states. I'm, I'm happy to say that we have 10, for instance, in the, in the city of New Orleans. Right? We've become sort of the largest provider of medications to the uninsured population in New Orleans. We're turning on Milwaukee. Uh, upstate New York and communities throughout the country. What's interesting is that our model, right, like any good supply chain model, gets cheaper the bigger you get, right? It's about sort of leveraging those fixed costs. And so as we found, um, a real new opportunity comes into play, and that is abroad. So God willing, uh, at this point in time, the, the house is passing, uh, its bill, but what we find is that there is much, much more need out there. What we find is that part of the excitement is that we have uh, figured out what's called this middle mile. Right? So you've got you know, small dispensing sites uh, and you've got sort of manufacturers willing to provide medicine. For instance, abroad, it is not uncommon for a developing country to receive over four tons of donated medication. The problem is it's uh, not necessarily all the medicine they need. The problem is it's in a different language. It's not part of their essential drug list. It becomes sort of this quagmire. It sits in a warehouse and it never gets dispensed. What we've done is we've tried to build a model that not only works in the United States, which was our, really our pilot, but it goes abroad. And so we're equally excited to be able to sort of announce the power of scale and our ability to support a country for less than a million dollars. 
right? That we can pick up our infrastructure, our inventory system, our bin system, and, else, uh, and other sort of parts of the equation and drop them into to developing countries. And in partnership with the pharmaceutical companies, develop the medication they need, uh, hopefully in, in perpetuity as part of their overall goals of providing for the public health in their country. So on that note, it has been an absolute privilege and an honor. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day.